Uh, this is Matt, uh, sorry for the, the connection trouble. Okay, uh, the programming language is a hot topic among the developers. Uh, you know, some people like Ruby, some people like Python, and then, okay, some fight each other. <laughs> <laughs> like Emacs and VM. And then, but uh, mo for most of the people, the programming language uh, to study, you know, you study programming language to implement your application. So that you, know, you, you study C, Java, Python, to, or Ruby to implement your application. So that, but uh, for some people, uh, programming language uh, to create. So that for those people, including me, the language design matters. And uh, I believe it matters to, to you too. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you, could you wait for a second? <laughs> <laughs> I made a mistake in my slides. <laughs> yep. So the because the learning the design of the programming language uh, make you a better programmer, so that you to have the better programming skill, and then then you you will understand the rationale behind the language design so that like, you don't have to worry about the you know it called random choice in the, the programming language and then sometimes you wonder so that why this method or this language feature design like this but uh, if you understand the design of the programming language probably you can understand the, the design uh, philosophy or policy behind the the design in Ruby, Python, whatever, and then the and then there's no one side game. So that uh, programming language designers make some kind of a compromise each day. So that uh, we have trade off. So that when we uh, focus on the performance, maybe we have to sacrifice the usability toward the uh, programmer. So the programmer have to write more to achieve the performance in some cases. Or uh, if you want to uh, write your program in very concise way, like doing the metaprogramming, so that you have some kind of the side effect of the, you know, the, some kind of the hiccups or something like that. So that you, by learning the design of the programming language, you, you can understand the trade-off in the design of the languages and the design of, of your application. So that the yeah, trade-off is our friend. So that we have to face trade-off each day as a, as a programmer. But uh, by learning, studying the design of a programming language, you can uh, learn some kind of a case study of the, the trade-offs. Then, 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 not everyone, but some of you, might try creating your own programming language. Uh, maybe your programming language may not be popular, but uh, the designing your own programming language itself is a very valuable experience, and uh, I believe it will make you better programmer. And then, okay, in this presentation, I'm uh, talking about the design of Ruby language uh, through the reserved words. Uh, and uh, the source of inspiration of design Ruby. Uh, Ruby has 41 reserved words. That's kind of many. And uh, each reflects the early design decisions of the language. The and, uh, story behind those reserved words. The Ruby is kind of famous for using the begin and end. So that, you know, Unlike other programming languages like Java or JavaScript or C, they use uh, braces to, to create the, block, the code blocks. But uh, instead of using braces, uh, Ruby used the end keyword. So that your Ruby program will see a lot, lot of ends. But, but it's, it's kind of the intentional. 
uh, it is called algo style. The, in ancient time, the, we had a programming language named algo uh, that created right after the fourth round. And then the, the current most of the current programming language are influenced somehow by algo. Then uh, the algo used the begin and ends to, to note the code blocks. But uh, like the programming language like Algo or Pascal or, or what the, those languages use the, uh, the begin and end as a code parentheses, code blocks. And the code blocks begins with the keyword begin and end with the end, like braces. But in Ruby, we don't, we don't use uh, begin that much because of the uh, Ruby used the second generation of, uh, second generation of the, uh, the begin and style, which is a comb style indentation. Like uh, we have if, then code blocks, then else, and then code blocks, and end. This is kind of like a comb, hair comb. So that we call it, we call them the code style indentation. That style is inherited from the programming language named Eiffel. Eiffel is a less popular programming language, less famous programming language uh, designed in 80s, but uh, uh, it's a kind of an interesting programming language. And it has, a, even though it's created in the 80s, it has a JIT compiler, and uh, it has the, the uh, multiple inheritance, and uh, it has quite an uh, interesting approach to the object-oriented programming language. So that back then, the only uh, major object-oriented programming language is uh, C++ or Smalltalk. Then back then, IFR came in as a very unique programming language. It's kind of the, it's kind of the yeah, modern things. But uh, unfortunately, IFL didn't get the popularity that much. And then, so very few people still use uh, IFL. But uh, in 80s, late 80s, I was, uh, I was a university student, and I, I bo uh, bought a book about the, the, the programming language IFL, and I influenced a lot, I was influenced a lot uh, that I inherited those comb style indentation from Eiffel, and then the, those keywords like a, a rescue and ensure and retry, and th those keywords are inherited from Eiffel, uh, from uh, for a little bit different uh, way though. Okay, next uh, we have the in Ruby we have the the keywords uh, reserved words like a break next redo, which controls the the loop. Execution. So the break time is the loop. Next, skip the execution of the of the loop into the, the next iteration, and we do restart the uh, execution of the the loop from from the start. And uh, we don't use continue as in as in say C or other languages. Uh, next is inherited from Perl. And then because it's shorter than continue. <laughs> the, uh, very early stage of the Ruby design, uh, uh, the Ruby was influenced uh, heavily from the language named Perl. Uh, because I, I started uh, developing Ruby in 93. Back then, we, the Python is not that popular. Java is not popular. <laughs> Java didn't exist at all. And then the, as a scripting language, the Perl is the, the major things. So the, I try to mimic Perl, I try to, uh, my programming language as a replacement to the uh, Perl programming language. And uh, yeah, I actually, I confess that I regret I mimicked too much. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, that tells you that it is quite difficult to foresee the future, you know. The, for, you know, for me, 25 years ago, so that mimicking Perl is, uh, is a good strategy, it seems, seems to be a good strategy. But uh, 
you know, some two decades later, the power is nearly gone, and then Python is popular. So that probably I should have maybe more Python <laughs> <laughs> than Perl. But uh, actually, I stole some ideas from Python. For example, the class on death is a stone from Python. <laughs> and the idea of module is from Lisp. Uh, actually, the, the old object-oriented Lisp is named flavors. So that uh, in the, the, that object system, flav flavor object system invented the idea of the mixing, which is the base, base uh, uh, which is a base of the, the idea of the module. In, in Ruby. So, okay. Next. Yeah, we have very uh, usual if, else, and else if. And uh, yeah, this is quite usual, but uh, uh, else if is kind of a controversy. Some people prefer else if, <laughs> and some people uh, use else if. And then some other language like a Python and Shell use Elif. What do you choose? <laughs> <laughs> it's arbitrary. So the else if you're okay, else if, Elif. Uh, I pick else if because this, that is the shortest pronounceable <laughs> combination. You know? Uh, but elif is not really a short, not the same pronunciation of elsef. So it's a different. Actually, it's a reverse of the file. <laughs> <laughs> so the, but the elsef is an un, unpronounced e, is not, not really uh, yeah, comfortable. So that I pick elsef. Uh, then, then we don't use then <laughs> in Ruby, but it's kind of a stop word. And then, actually, we have the then method and the class method in Ruby. Uh, that allows me that if it is clear, you can use the uh, method with the same name of the reserved words. This is unusual for the programming languages. But uh, if you if you want to retrieve the class of the of, of an object, you want to call the method. What the method name should be? Class. But the class is a reserved word, so that in many programming language, so that it causes error. But uh, cl the me class method is so natural, so that I allowed <laughs> the, the using the. the the key method name with the reserved word. Unless, yeah, it's from Perl. Maybe we don't need, we didn't need it. <laughs> and then, it's, you know, reverse logic is sometimes difficult. So that, you know, putting not in the front of the, uh, of the, the conditions and the wrapping in the parentheses, it's kind of ugly, so we we sometimes use all this. But uh, we don't we don't provide a an else if or else else unless to the to the uh, unless class because you know that kind of things is too complex. So that okay, just just use if statement for that cases. <laughs> yeah, it gets confusing. While is a while. Yeah, every every uh, language has a while while loops, a for loops. I don't remember, but probably it's from Python. <laughs> Until it's a loop loop things, and then uh, yeah, you guess it, it's from Perl. <laughs> and then uh, in condition we use the true, false, and nil, and then uh, that's indicated that that. Our concept of the true C and false C in Ruby. Unlike other languages, uh, nil and false are false. <laughs> it's kind of confusing. 
Neil and Fo- Neil and false are falsy, and everything else is truth. Uh, in other languages, like a zero is a tr- is a false, and empty array, uh, empty array or empty hash is a false. But uh, you know, it's one thing. Is it's confusing, so that it should be clear. Then, uh, and uh, it's this. Uh, in addition, it's kind of costly. Okay, I ha- I have this string. Okay, this must be uh, true or false if the length is zero. So that we have to look into the structure of the strings and then check the length of the strings. Or if the value is the array, uh, we have to look into the uh, inside of the, the array structure, then check the length if the, the length is zero or something. It's kind of costly. And the condition, is, the loop condition is uh, checks uh, so many times so that I want to uh, optimize the truth, truth checking. Actually, in Ruby implementation, the truth, false, uh, truth, true, false uh, decision is only a, the one bit checking. It is quite a lightweight operation. But uh, if I allow you know, the empty array to be false, we have to check in using the functions or something. Or maybe if, okay, if I allow the object to be uh, over like the two boolean or something, and if two boolean returns true, it's, it, the value is true, or if two boolean returns nil, it, it, it should be nil or something like that. So that the, we have to call method implicitly every time in every conditionals. That is, that is costly. So that, you know, I know Ruby is slow compared to C++ or something. And I, I don't want to be even, I, I want to be Ruby to be even slower so that I just skip that kind of things to, to optimize the con- conditional checking. And then in addition, so that by using false and nil, we can uh, implement the kind of the three value uh, lo- logic. Okay, uh, f- the implicit false for the false value, and then nil for in existing value or something like that. Uh, in some language like SQL, uh, the, we have three value mod- uh, that model, three value checking. There are non existence and uh, false are false, uh, considered as a false, and then the everything else is true. Then, ac- almost accidentally, and uh, the Ruby can provide a, a three value model. It's inspired by the, the traditional Lisp. Traditional Lisp uh, has the both false and nil. And then I inherited the, this idea from Lisp. Uh, and or not. Ruby has the operator named uh, alphabetical and or not. And then these are taken from Perl. And then it's there for only for precedence. <laughs> and, uh, uh, having, you know, the ampersand, ampersand uh, operator, logical operator, or uh, the vertical, two vertical bars operator or operator has kind of the, the precedence issue. So that we have, when in doubt, we have to put the uh, parentheses around the, around the expression. But uh, uh, and this, this and or not has a very low precedence, so that you don't have to worry about the uh, you know the breaking the e- expression. Uh, besides the, the and in Ruby and 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 or these these two logical operators has the very lower same precedence because in English we don't have precedence over the and and or so that you have to when you use the and or in the English sentence, so that you have to worry about the, the you know, confusion. So that, that's why the, the, these two precedents are same. Okay, uh, do not yield. So the, it's called a block. 
So that in Ruby, you can put the, the you know, fragment of code after the, the method call, which is called block. It's, the idea is taken from the language named Clue, uh, in, which is invented in MIT and in the 70s. And then the, it's kind of modified from Clue because the in Clue, the, these kind of th the blocks uh, that we, they call them the iterators uh, are only used for uh, loops. But in Ruby, you can use blocks for loops, callbacks, and then code blocks, scopes, and in, ma in many uh, use cases. But then, uh, that kind of enhancement is, I, I believe it's the biggest invention of Ruby. So that, actually it's kind of similar to the you know, higher order function in other programming languages, like Lisp, Haskell, and those functional programming languages. But uh, uh, one, in one survey, so that 98% uh, of the higher precedence function, uh, higher order function, is takes one functions. That means that uh, for most of the cases, very uh, except very few cases, the one uh, one function taking one function is uh, sufficient. That means that uh, if one taking one function is sufficient, so that uh, restricting uh, method to be taking one uh, functional argument. And then take a special syntax for that kind of the, the one function, a higher order of calling is good and very usable and easy to read in, root, uh, in the language. So that, that's why the, the block, the method called with block is the biggest invention of Ruby. Actually, uh, the modern programming language like Swift or Groovy or uh, Elixir uh, takes this idea from Ruby. So that, uh, you know, this is kind of neat idea. Okay, rescue, ensure, retry. These are exception handling. So in some languages, so that uh, they, they t t use the word that try and then uh, try, accept, or something like that. But uh, I don't want to use that, that term try because, you know, exception is, ex exception is usual. So that every method is usual. And then I, I don't want to, okay, this method might raise error. So that, should I try or something like that? <laughs> this is, this is kind of, you know, weak-minded. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so I, I want to be, you know, okay, this method may, uh, may cause, uh, this region may cause uh, exception. I want to handle uh, the exceptions in, in those methods. So that okay, just begin is good enough to say the region. Okay, shall I try? <laughs> no, no, just begin. <laughs> then, okay. It's okay, except this error. No, okay. Something bad happens. We have to rescue them. <laughs> you know, these, these words from taken from Eiffel, as I told you before. But uh, yeah, it's, but uh, you know, I don't, I don't regret the choice, of the choice of the words. Actually, in the early stage of uh, Ruby design, so that, uh, Lang there are languages named icon, which is not the icon in, in, the, in the screen, but uh, it it's predates the, the term icon. So that, uh, that language has the success failure model. So every method, uh, every function, I mean, every function can uh, success with value or failure. Uh, for, for the user of the, the modern programming language, so every method can return an option or a maybe in, uh, for example, uh, Swift. So that those modern programming languages use the, the, the value of the, the 
success failure model. But uh, in the ancient programming language named ICON, everything uh, was a success failure model. And uh, I tried to uh, use this model in Ruby in a very early design, but uh, it's too different from other programming language. So I, I just um, g gave up and then used the exception instead. Uh, return is return. Uh, it's from C, but uh, in Ruby, the return takes uh, multiple values using the tuple. I mean the RE in Ruby. Uh, Ruby used the, the keywords named self and super, which is uh, inherited from Smalltalk, and uh, it's a parent of the object system of Ruby. So that, uh, if you have a chance, you had a chance to look into the, the Ruby source code and in the file named object.c, which has the, some weird diagram of the class hierarchy. And then uh, you have object, object has a, a class, and the class is an instance of a class class. <laughs> and the class is an uh, instance of an object, but the object itself is a class. It is kind of uh, kind of loop. So that this kind of the weird object model uh, is inherited from object uh, small talk. Actually, class has its own class named the meta class, and the meta class itself is a class. <laughs> kind of confusing, but uh, those, those whole object system is inherited from small talk. <coughs> Elias and Andef. Uh, unlike other programming languages, uh, Ruby uh, put the, the alias of the me method, and uh, you can even remove the method from our class. Uh, this is kind of weird idea. Uh, according to the, uh, the basic pr uh, design principles of the object-oriented design, uh, it, there are the basic principle of the risk of re replacement uh, uh, principle. Uh, the risk of is the, the professor at the MIT, which uh, she happened to invent a language named Clue, which is the, the source of the block, uh, the idea of a block. And then she, uh, risk of replacement principle is the uh, subclass must uh, satisfy the role of the superclass. So uh, using undef is clearly uh, contradict to the principle. But uh, the idea is from taken from the language named the Caesar, uh, which is invented in 1980s in uh, University of California, Berkeley. And uh, Caesar is uh, uh, the, you know, mimic language of the Eiffel, but uh, it implemented the, its own I ideas. And then, but, uh, you know, when I look at the, I st stole the idea of the alias and the death, it does, the version of the Caesar was uh, the version one of 0 0.8. And then, uh, the Caesar is totally gone. So that after, the designer was graduated from the UCB, so that they, he stopped the developing it, and that they gradually disappear in the history of the internet. But the, when you Google it, you can find the documentation of the version named the Caesar version 1.2, which is the latest version, and that, which doesn't have alias under the dev. <laughs> anyway, uh, Actually, I regret a little bit about the, the putting undev to the language. <laughs> uh, begin and end in capital. Uh, you may not know that, but uh, if you put the begin uh, the, in, the pro in your program and put a brace around that, the, those uh, codes will be uh, executed in the beginning of your program. And if you put the, the capital N and put the brace around the and code, those programs will be executed at the end of your program. 
It's, it's, the idea is taken from, uh, oh, taking a picture? <laughs> yeah. The idea is taken from the oak, and uh, yeah, remember, Ruby was uh, invented as a scripting language, and the oak is one of the scripting language, so that, yeah, I, I assumed it was a good idea, but uh, nowadays, People don't use Ruby as a scripting language. It's, it's they, you use Ruby as a web programming language, you know, general purpose programming language. So that probably we don't no longer need begin and begin and end no more. So that it's not recommended anymore, but it's still there. Uh, file on the line so that you can get the the file of the the program. And the line number of the of the that particular line, it's from C. In addition, Ruby has the uh, encoding, which is the the file encoding, uh, from one point nine. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about that. Okay, uh, in eighties and uh, early nineties. We don't have uni. We didn't have Unicode, so that each country has its own uh, the character encoding. Uh, the English-speaking people are okay because ASCII is okay. yeah ASCII can express everything. But uh, unfortunate country like Japan <laughs> or China, so that we need more characters. <laughs> Actually, thousands of characters, so that we have to, we had to invent our own character encoding, and then we have to handle those encoding in our program. So that to handle those uh, char characters, there are two ways to handle it. One is the universal character set approach, which is basically the Unicode. But uh, the, uh, the other one is a character set independent uh, approach. Uh, UCS approach is uh, to process the de text data, the first convert everything into Unicode, then to process the text, then convert back into the, the legacy encoding and write in the file. This is natural. But, uh, it has problem because character set encoding is legacy. There's no way to predict the which encoding is correct because, for example, uh, in Japan we have the the character encoding set named uh, character encoding scheme named as shift chess, uh, which can uh, describe the Japanese character set, but uh, we have tons of dialects <laughs> and uh, IBM has its own dialect, Microsoft has its own dialect and uh, adding a little bit more characters in for their own companies or something like that. But uh, there's no way to tell the difference between the IBM encoding and uh, the Microsoft encoding. So that when you try to encoding, uh, convert the shift text into Unicode, but uh, it is it really was a shift just um, IBM encoding. The data was lost, so that and then the, the process uh, the text processing data is wrong, and then converting back to shift you you will have the broken text, or maybe some er by some errors, maybe some uh, the character is broken, the total conversion will collapse and the whole text might, might, might be lost. That kind of things would happen if you have the tons of the legacy text. Okay. Okay. Repeatedly, English speaking people are okay. <laughs> and uh, the most programming language uh, designed by the English speaking people or you know European language, you know, very limited character set. Yeah. 
so that the, for them, the byte encodings are good enough. That's okay. But for us Asian people, we have very huge trouble. So that, that's why we, uh, we Ruby people, pick the, uh, the, the call set independent approach. So that, uh, in Ruby, uh, you don't have to convert anything. So that the, for SIFTJS text, you can process it as a SIFTJS. For the Unicode text, you can uh, handle them as a Unicode, UTF-8 or UTF-16 even. Or maybe in the legacy Chinese encoding or legacy Taiwanese encoding, you can handle them without any conversion. So the, but uh, you know, it was designed in 90s. <laughs> These days, okay, Unicode is almost take over the world. But, uh, Maybe the future programming language will no longer handle the legacy encoding. But uh, for us, especially in, the, the, in that age, 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it is quite important for us to handle legacy encoding. Yeah. So, okay, these are Ruby's reserved words. So that those words are taken from other programming language and uh, we thinks very carefully to uh, which language to steal the ideas and yeah, that concept. Okay. Say, okay, let, in addition, let me uh, explain anything, something new. Okay, chaining operators. Uh, in language like uh, F sharp from Microsoft and Elixir, so that we have the something named the pipeline operator, like this. Now, in, by pipeline operator, so that you can combine two functions in in diverse way. So that uh, in Ruby you can write like this. So that it's almost similar. So the the the. Original idea of pipeline operator is invented in F# -sharp and the ML like family language, and its definition is this: this is the pipeline operator definition. So ML like language, by wrapping in the parentheses, you can define the function name with the operator names, and then the, it takes two arguments x and f. Then uh, you can call the second argument as a function. Then first argument as a as a it's a op, uh, operand. That means that you can add the primary argument at the last of the uh, the arguments. For example, the map function. Map function in F# -sharp and ML languages. Uh, map function takes a, a you know array and a function, and a apply the every each element in the in the array in a collection to the function. Then okay in ML ML family language the function comes last of the arguments. The array is the first argument of the map function. Because map is very important. We, I, we call them the uh, primary arguments. The primary arguments comes first, function comes last. Okay, but uh, the, in Elixir, uh, pipeline operator is defined as a macro, and uh, it adds primary argument as the first argument of the function call. So the map function in Elixir, fun uh, the array comes first. Uh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Okay, uh, the first argument comes. Hmm? Okay, uh, the the collection comes first. The function comes last. Uh, I made a mistake. So yeah, uh, the primary argument in ML language F sharp uh, function comes first. <laughs> then array comes last. And uh, in Elixir, it's reverse. Yeah, it's it's a uh, you know it's no no wonder. Then a basic 
uh, the culture in behind the language is different. So the you know the the function argument order is different. That's okay. So the uh, concept of the pipeline operator is the pr are the primary argument to the call. So that that's important. Okay. Uh, no matter which order of the of the function call, so the pipeline operator as the primary argument of the left-handed left-hand side expression put in the uh, uh, the to the call in the, the proper place uh, of the language. So that if I add the pipeline operator, operator in Ruby, so that are uh, the primary argument to the call. Then, remember in Ruby, map function, I mean map method, takes the primary argument, which is the array, as a receiver of the call. So the, you know, unlike F# -sharp or Elixir, we don't put it in the usual argument, but the receiver. So the, as a result, the the pipeline operator in Ruby pipeline operator becomes the alternative syntax of the method called dot operator. But uh, in Ruby, the different uh, operator precedents is, is, uh, already exist, like blocks. We have two forms of the blocks, like uh, do and end, and uh, braces. It, it has the different uh, precedents for that. So, and then we, by using the pipeline operator, we have the less parentheses, like, uh, like example above. Okay, what is? Like this and this, this and this. Okay, a little bit less <laughs> parentheses. Uh, I thought it was a good idea. <laughs> I thought it was a good idea. And then, but uh, let's see. We experimented. We put in the the master of the the development uh, branch of the Ruby. Let's Ruby, and um, unfortunately, people don't understand. <laughs> yeah, for them, uh, the concept of the pipeline operator is the adding pri uh, the left hand side expression as a usual argument of the method call. That is that is crucial for them. And uh, I explained about the primary operator and then in Ruby as a the, as a culture the primary operator comes as a receiver so the natural consequence is the, the taking adding primary operator as a receiver but uh, still people don't understand <laughs> but, you know the language design is you know is built upon the kind of the common sense you know uh, the shared knowledge between users. But uh, uh, this fact, people don't understand, this fact indicates that we don't share the same idea, same concept of the pipeline operator. And then even after explaining it, the, the many users stick to the, the previous idea of adding a uh, left-hand side expression into the ordinary argument. So the, it's a kind of the, you know, recognition problem. And then I, and then if I were very stick with this idea, and then I strong, I, if I were strongly opinionated about this idea, I will try to proceed the community with uh, years ahead, but uh, I'm not that I'm not that passionate about that. This idea, okay, okay, uh, having less, few less percentages is okay, a little bit very beautiful, but uh, if not, it's okay. <laughs> so I gave up. <laughs> 
Now that it's it's not it's before the 2.7 final release, so that it's it's okay. It was just a uh, experiment. Okay, I had to experiment because you know, unlike the the early stage of Ruby, so that it's quite difficult to change Ruby language because the even slightest backward compatibility breaks many 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 code. So that we have to ex experiment heavily before making any changes. So that uh, we usually take a one year uh, cycle of release be between releases because we have we have the the time slot to experiment the ideas. So that uh, as a community, we have to keep moving forward, but at the same time, we cannot break the code. It's kind of contradiction. But uh, we community, we the core developers have to uh, take this kind of the narrow path. Uh, at least we get through this discussion, we get some ideas. So that in the past, we cannot allow the comments in between the, the method chain like this. The when Ruby browser see this comment, it's stops the, the method chaining. But it's kind of the, you know, bad things. It is kind of against our expectation that we fixed our parsers to allow this comment between the method chain. This is one good thing. Uh, and uh, and uh, we are aware of the uh, requirement for the right assignment. Okay, when we uh, when we have to write the assign the the resulting value from this method chain okay this this method chain you have to go back to the top and assign to the variable. But uh, it's it's against our eye movement, you know, go, go like this, go like uh, uh, left to right, top to bottom. Then when you assign it, you have to go back to the top, then assign to the variable. But uh, if we allow the right assignment like this, okay, I process this, then that, then that, then that, then assign to the variable, right assign. It's, it's kind of natural. So that, you know, we are still experimenting in the, this idea, but uh, uh, we might see it in the future will be. But the making decision is quite tough. But, uh, we need a scope of the, every change has its scope, so that you cannot break the existing code, and uh, your change might affect uh, you know, unexpected uh, region. And then every change has its background. Like, uh, say, the pipeline operator has uh, this policy or something like that. But uh, this uh, policy and recognition might not be accepted by the, you know, the major members of the community. And then uh, we we need a re motivation behind the behind the change. Maybe uh, by using these changes, uh, the Ruby code will be more readable or e more easy to write or something like that. And then this is kind of tough choice. The, the making decision, especially the language design, is tough choice. Then we use the uh, the way we call it the BDFL. Uh, benevolent and data for life. <laughs> okay, that taking one person to make every decision, trying to be consistent, trying to be better. But as, uh, some other languages take a committee style. For example, PHP takes committee style. Every change is, is uh, voted. Then uh, every, every change is it decided by some kind of a democratic way, voting. And then, but uh, I, I'm not sure. I, 
I don't think that that would be uh, works well with the programming language because a ship would climb a mountain with many captains or too many cooks for the balls. So uh, the language design has very uh, many issues and the consideration. And uh, in summary, we took many ideas from the pre-existence uh, pre forerunners and uh, combine them in one in harmony. That is good. And uh, we have a lot of the contradiction between fe language features, but uh, we have to resolve it and we have to make trade-off. And uh, in the toughest part, toughest part in the language design is making decision. And uh, I think it is same to the to the the software design. The toughest part in the software development is making decision. So the programmers are uh, the biggest role is making decision. And uh, uh, surveying pre-existence or uh, taking ideas from others and then uh, adapting, adapting the ideas into the current software. And then once you make a decision, so that go through it with the confidence, that, that kind of the leadership and the making decision is a very crucial part of the software design. Okay, this is, this is all, my, all my talk and I think, uh, I thank you for listening, thank you.